Hello, this is going to be just a brief overview of the canon of African art history, how it is constructed, why it's constructed, etc. So this should be pretty brief. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Now, as you know, you are required to take an African art history course or Asian art. Um, African art history is seen as um, very, very influential in the West for the avant-garde in the early 20th century. <clears throat> what you're looking at here is on the left, a work by Picasso. This is one of the faces from Le Demoiselle d'Avignon, which is one of the um, seminal pieces of the early 20th century. It's a painting uh, that led to Cubism. Uh, and on the right, we see a face mask. <clears throat> And you can see how there is a lot of similarity between these two. Uh, so Picasso had the ability to view um, African objects. They were collected and displayed in cabinets of curiosities, which I discuss in the other lecture for this week. Um, but also they were seen in things like thrift stores and flea markets. And he described in his journal going to a flea market and seeing this. Um, and it really influenced his uh, artistic direction. Okay, uh, this is another um, sketch for uh, Le Demoiselle d'Avignon. So prior to uh, Cubism and Le Demoiselle d'Avignon, which let me show you what that one is since I keep referencing it. <clears throat> Picasso had a very naturalistic style, but he was trying to come up with something different, something kind of edgy. He was searching for something with his art that he just wasn't finding. Um, and so he felt that uh, he, the African art allowed him to access this uh, because of the um, less realistic proportions um, and the way that figures were portrayed. Um, and this, what he perceived as this emphasis on spirituality. So what you see here is La Demoiselle d'Avignon, painted in 1907. Um, and his influence is taken from African masks seen on the right. Uh, in the center, Iberian, which is um, the ancient peoples in Spain. And on the far left is taken from um, an Egyptian tomb. And you can see that he is distorting reality here. He's bringing the foreground and meshing it with the background. Um, and it was uh, African art that really influenced him um, along with Iberian art to make this sort of change. So these objects that were being seen by him, what were these like? What was he seeing? Why were these the objects that he was seeing? So what I'm going to talk to you about in this lecture is the idea of the canon of African art history, right? So um, the things that you can expect to see when you go into an art museum, into the African section, are typically things that constitute this canon, okay? Um, and so Western art history has a canon as well. And within the canon, you would find things like paintings by da Vinci and Michelangelo and um, Raphael, right? So the big names, those are who comprise um, much of the canon in Western art history. You'd see Picasso as well. Uh, so within African art history, it's important to consider what constitutes the canon and who created it. <clears throat> this image is from 1933 and it shows paintings by Andre Durand um, with African sculptures for comparison so that people could look at these paintings and look at the African objects and see how uh, Durand had been inspired. Okay, so what we're looking at here, these are figurative, they're anthropomorphic, they're, they look human-like, um, and they are made of wood. These are sculptures. And as mentioned in class, they are completely decontextualized. You would never see these objects displayed in this way. Um, you wouldn't really see these objects because they would be kept within an enclosure. Um, these are reliquary guardians. So they guard reliquary bundles or the remains of the ancestors. Um, they have a very spiritual function. They would be 
lashed to these bundles. They would be tied to the bundles and they are an integral part of the bundles. They were never intended to be separated from these bundles. Okay, um, and the people who brought these objects to the West had a very specific idea of what would constitute art for them. So this is Jacob Epstein's uh, studio. So this is a sculptor. This was taken roughly 1959. And you can see that he has African objects here, here, and then here he has what are probably Greek and Roman or mostly Roman replicas um, from, you know, roughly, uh, roughly uh, when BCE became CE. Okay, so very old and then much more modern, but depicted in a very different style. And so what you're seeing here are sculptures made of wood. Um, you are not seeing the interest in the context in which these works were made. You're not seeing an interest in who made them, why they were made, what they were made for, why they are important. You're not seeing any of that. So those who contributed to the idea of the canon, right? Um, think about who contributes to the idea of what constitutes art. So you have scholars, you have artists, you have museum curators, but at this time, the most important um, people who decided what would go in the canon, and by most important, I mean those who had the most influence on this idea of the canon were collectors. So as you'll read in the article by Steiner, which is the um, PDF that I uploaded to Blackboard, many of these artists, uh, not artists, apologies, many of these collectors have never been to Africa. They see no need to go to Africa. They um, really appreciate these objects for their formal qualities and are almost completely disinterested in the context in which they were made. Um, so these objects, especially um, at the beginning of the collection of African art, um, would have been picked for representation of a type rather than an artist. So even though the artist would be known within the culture of origin, there was, that was not recorded by the collectors. Um, and if you know who the artist is, that really kind of humanizes the artist and it makes it seem more like Western art. So if you have something that is just anonymous, um, it, it lets you uh, impose your own interpretations onto it. Um, and if you had known who the artist of these works was, this would distract from the universally understood spirituality. So there's this idea that African art is able to communicate with anyone who looks at it. There's absolutely no need to know anything about African art. Um, you can look at it and instantly intuit uh, why it's important, what it means. So there's this idea, um, and again, all of this is incredibly problematic and I'm in no way endorsing it. I'm just trying to um, present to you the viewpoint. So there is this idea that um, there's kind of like a, a base individual inside, right? So like more towards our caveman sort of thing. Um, and looking at African art really taps into that primal individual. Um, and there is this idea that you can simply sense the spirituality of these things. Um, and it doesn't have to be a spirituality that you understand or that you practice, um, but you can just tell that these have like an aura of essentially magic. And in fact, if you go to um, the African Art Museum in Paris, which is also where um, Picasso went and saw some of these objects, it's called the Musée de Quai Branly, uh, you'll see that they often use the word magic in the labels. Okay, um, and this is just to show you, uh, this is a contemporary photo, but it's at the Barnes Foundation, which has preserved um, the way that the original collector displayed these objects. So you have um, Renaissance triptych here, you have Modigliani, you have Picasso, and you have these African objects in the center. So what constitutes the canon in African art in the West? It has almost nothing to do with African sensibilities and is almost completely about Western sensibilities. 
um, and it has to be authentic. So I mentioned in class uh, the idea of um, it has to kind of fit this stereotype for something that you might picture if you were to picture um, Africa several hundred years ago and um, you know, like all of these problematic stereotypes that are being imposed on various peoples within Africa, right? So again, as we talked about in class, here you have this female who's nude. Um, she has an emphasis on different parts of her physique than we see in the West. Um, so the emphasis on the stomach. So the stomach is often seen as the seat of the soul. Um, or the head. The head can also be the seat of the soul. Uh, you see scarification, right? All of these things that make this work exotic also make it authentic. Um, and for something to be authentic, it has to have been um, uh, used in rituals. And uh, there, there's some really um, great but again, horrific and problematic quotes about you need to have like the sweaty spirituality of the rituals and the sacrifices inherent in it in order for it to be authentic. So as I mentioned in class, again, 1901 to 1950, early to mid 20th century, and yet other objects that are only a couple of years later, this one is 1965, uh, and you can see elements like this is probably scarification here, and yet he is dressed in a Western style with the, the sandals and this, um, I, I know they're not called onesies, but uh, kind of looks like a one piece, um, the hairstyle. And so this is something that would not be authentic because it has been tainted by the West. Right? And so there's this idea of a pure Africa before colonization that is untainted by civilization, all of these things. And so there's this view of Africa as being more primal and less advanced. Um, and so for something to be considered authentic, it has to be from that primal state in Africa. It can't uh, depict modernity, right? So, um, the, the essence of being modern. That's, that's completely inauthentic, right? So most of the objects that fit the canon uh, of African art in the West have actually been removed from Africa, and yet that's only a small portion of objects from African history. So again, as I mentioned in class and I mentioned in the other video, uh, African art tends to be very ephemeral. Um, it doesn't always last very long simply because the materials with which it is made, right? Whether it is textiles um, or wood, uh, or if it uh, involves animal elements that are decaying, etc. right? So not all of these last very long time. So um, there's this emphasis on a very specific look, very specific objects um, and things that uh, exclude the art of women. Um, so textiles and basket weaving, all of these things. I apologize, my computer froze for a second. Um, but what you're seeing here is a sculpture that is, again, inspired by African art. Um, and you can see all of these elements are really inspired by African art, and they are part of the early 20th century avant-garde. So Steiner, who wrote the article that you're going to be reading in the PDF, um, he says that African art is perceived as a blank slate onto which one can project your own meanings and illusions. Right? So think about that. You have something that is very formally appealing. It has a very nice aesthetic and you can make it mean whatever you want. Right, So it's not just um, a portrait of a woman from the Renaissance who very clearly is a portrait. Um, and it's not something that is potentially, you know, has ethical implications or you can just impose whatever you want onto this. And so this is seen as like a very soothing sort of primal spiritual undertaking to collect this. 
there's this assumption that African art communicates perfectly across cultural divides, rendering any knowledge of the piece unnecessary. And even knowing what the piece is for can actually be an impediment or make it harder to understand and appreciate the object on this very um, spiritual level. Okay, so that is the African canon, essentially, and those who have constructed it. So hopefully you can see that this is something that um, is still perpetrated in our museums, although there is um, emphasis to start to include other types of objects. Um, if you go to the DIA, the African Art Gallery is primarily traditional, although it does have a few um, contemporary artworks. Uh, and it has some contemporary in the hallway on the right hand side of the African Art Gallery. Um, so there is definitely this movement to try to integrate African art more into um, nowadays, uh, but it's still a big problem. And so what we have now has been established by the people who collected this art in the late 19th, early to mid 20th century. And so it's something that we are still reckoning with and it's important for you to think about. So as promised, very short and that's it. All right.